Hey, what's up everyone? Today we're going to be doing the equilibrium section of the 2023 USNCO local exam. That is questions 31 through 36. Let's start with question 31. What mass of lead to fluoride KSP of that will dissolve in one liter of water? Let's write out the dissociation uh, equation of this. So it's going to be lead uh, fluoride uh, PBF2 is in equilibrium with the lead ion plus two fluoride ions. And so what is the KSP for this uh, equilibrium? Well, that's gonna be the concentration of your lead times the concentration of your fluoride to the second power since you have a coefficient of two here. Now we wanna find out what mass of lead to fluoride will dissolve in, a, in one liter of water. So let's find out the solubility of our lead fluoride. We can do this by saying that the concentration of our lead ion that, disso that dissociates is going to be x, and therefore the amount of our fluorine that dissociates is going to be 2x, since they are in a 1 to 2 ratio in their dissociation equilibrium. So our Ksp is going to equal x times 2x squared, and we're told that the Ksp is 4 times 10 to the negative 8. That means 4 uh, x cubed is equal to 4 times 10 to the negative 8. And if you plug that into your calculator, that's going to be 1 times 10 to the negative 8 uh, to the cube root, so to the 1 third power. Uh, that tells you that x is equal to 2.15 times 10 to the negative 3. Now, what's the units for this? Well, this is molarity. So this tells you that per one liter, you're gonna have 2.15 times 10 to the negative three moles of lead that dissociates. And the question asks us for the mass of lead to fluoride that dissociate that will dissolve in one liter of water. So this is the number of moles of lead, which means this is gonna be the same number of moles of lead fluoride that dissociates. And so all we have to do is now convert moles to mass the molar mass of lead fluoride is going to be 245.2 grams per mole. So if we multiply the number of moles by the molar mass, so 245.2 times uh, that value, our mass of lead to fluoride that dissociates is going to be 0 0.53 grams, which is answer choice D. Hey everyone, I just want to say if some of these explanations seem a little fast paced to you, then I have a lot of videos on my channel that are more tutorial based. Uh, they can help you learn the content and then come back to these tests to take full advantage of them. Also, if you're enjoying the video, please feel free to leave a like and subscribe. As far as I know, these are the only videos on YouTube that have work solutions for the USNCO. Uh, so a like and a subscription would help it reach more people. Um, and that's it. Thanks guys. Enjoy the rest of the video. Let's move on to question 32. The Ka of peridium ion is 5.9 times 10 to the negative 6. What is the pH of a 0.17 molar solution of pyridine, uh, which is that? First, let's just write out what our Ka expression tells us. Our Ka is going to be your acid dissociation equilibrium constant. So it's going to be this. And so your H plus is going to get liberated. And then you're going to be left with C5H5N, which is your pyridine. We know that the Ka for this equation is 5.9 times 10 to the negative 6. So although we're given the Ka of the peridium ion, we're trying to find out the pH of a solution of pyridine. And since pyridine is formed from the peridium ion, then that means your pyridine is actually a base. So let's write out the equation that's happening with pyridine. Pyridine is going to act as a base, uh, which means that it is going to react with water and then it's going to form C5H5NH plus plus OH. Now, since we're given the Ka of our top equation, we can actually find out the Kb, since this is a base, of this equation. That's going to be 10 to the negative 14 divided by our Ka. Remember, your uh, Ka times Kb is equal to Kw, which is 10 to the negative 14. So our Kb is 10 to the negative 14 divided by our Ka, which is 5.9 times 10 to the negative 6. And so our Kb is equal to uh, 1.69 times 10 to the negative 9. 
Now, why is this helpful? This is helpful because you're given an initial concentration of pyridine and we want to find out the pH. So since you're given the initial concentration and you know your Kb, what you can do is you can calculate your concentration, your equilibrium concentration of OH, and you can use the relationship that pH plus pOH is equal to 14. So we can find out our concentration of OH, use that to find pOH, and then subtract that from 14 to find our pH. So in order to find out our equilibrium concentration of OH, let's create an ice table. So ICE, initial change in concentration and equilibrium concentration. Our initial concentration of our pyridine is going to be uh, 0 0.17. Uh, water is a liquid, so it doesn't count. And then our initial for the pyridium ion and our hydroxide are both zero. What is our change? Our change is going to be negative x. This is going to be plus x, and this is going to be plus x. And then so our equilibrium concentration is going to be 0.17 minus x. This is going to be x, and this is going to be x. So if you write out your Kb expression, our general Kb expression, that's going to be the concentration of C5, H5, NH+, plus, plus our hydroxide over the concentration of our reactant, which is your pyridine. So C5H5N, and we know this is going to equal uh, that number right here, the Kb. And so our, uh, our uh, pyridium ion concentration is X, our hydroxide concentration is also X, divided by our, pyri uh, our uh, pyridine concentration is 0 0.17 minus X, and that equals our Kb, which is 1.69 times 10 to the negative ninth. Now, since our Kb is very small, then that means this uh, dissociation is not happening a lot. And that means that we can use our 5% rule to say that the x, uh, the, this 0.17 minus x, is going to be very, very close to just 0.17. So we can simplify this expression to x squared over 0 0.17 is equal to Kb, which is 1.69 times 10 to the negative 9. And then from here, we can solve for x by doing the square root of 0.17 times 1.69 times 10 to the negative 9. So x, which if you remember, x was our concentration of hydroxide. Our, hy our hydroxide concentration is going to be 1.69 times 10 to the negative 5. And then from here, we can calculate our pOH. So pOH is uh, the negative log of your hydroxide concentration. So that's going to be the negative log of this number right here. So negative log of that number, our pOH is 4.77. And remember our pH and pOH that sum up to 14. So pH is equal to 14 minus pOH. Uh, pH is equal to 14 minus pOH. So let's do 14 minus the number that we just got. 14 minus pOH is going to be 9 uh, pH is equal to 9.23, which is answer choice D. Let's move on to question 33. Excess solid silver chloride is added to water and the mixture uh, and the mixture is stirred until equilibrium is achieved. Addition of which substance will increase the concentration of chloride ion in this solution? Now silver chloride uh, is insoluble in water, uh, so you have to keep that into account. Now there are a couple things that we can just get rid of. Adding more silver chloride is not gonna do anything because silver chloride is insoluble as is. If you add more, it's just gonna be insoluble. Adding water is not gonna affect equilibrium because that is a liquid and liquids don't affect equilibrium. You have uh, AgNO3, which isn't gonna do anything um, since silver chloride is insoluble. But ammonia, NH3, is a commonly known reagent that increases the solubility of silver chloride. Um, and so since that will increase the solubility of silver chloride, then that means you'll have more chloride ions forming. And that's why ammonia is going to be your answer. Let's move on to 34. 34 and 35 use a similar problem statement. So problems 34 and 35 are about the exothermic reaction of iodine with iodine ions shown below. 34, uh, that many moles of I2 and that many moles of uh, potassium iodine are dissolved in water at 25 degrees Celsius to give 100 mils of solution. 
what is the equilibrium concentration of I2 in this solution? Okay, this is a standard ice table problem. So let's write out our equilibrium that's happening. So I2 plus I minus uh, is in equilibrium with I3 minus. Let's write out our ice table. So our initial uh, molarity, uh, our, our initial concentration of I2 is going to be the number of moles of I2 divided by the volume. So our concentration of I2 is going to be the number of moles of I2, which is uh, 10 to the negative four uh, moles divided by our volume, which we're told that we have 100 mils of solution, which is 0.1 liters. So our concentration is going to be 10 to the negative three molar. So our initial concentration is 10 to the negative three. Let's do the same for uh, I, uh, the, the iodine ion. So we have a uh, concentration of I minus is gonna be the number of moles, which is four times 10 to the negative three moles divided by the volume, so 0.1 liters. And so that is four times 10 to the negative two molar, four times 10 to the negative two molar. And then our I3, our product is gonna have initial concentration of zero molar. Your change is going to be negative x for both the reactants and then plus x for the products. So your equilibrium uh, concentrations are 10 to the negative 3 minus x for I2, 4 times 10 to the negative 2 minus x for I minus, and then uh, x for I3. This is helpful because now you can plug into your KEQ. So our equilibrium expression for this equation is going to be the concentration of I3 minus divided by the concentrations of I2 times the concentration of I minus. And you can plug in the values that you just got. So our KEQ is gonna equal X over our I2 was 10 to the negative three minus X. And then you have four times 10 to the negative two minus X for I minus. And that is equal to your KEQ, which we're told is 750. Now, what we want to do is find, obviously, solve for x, and we're trying to find out the equilibrium concentration of I2. Our equilibrium concentration of I2, remember, was 10 to the negative 3 minus x. So if we find out what x is, then we can subtract uh, x uh, from 10 to the negative 3 to get the equilibrium concentration of I2. All right, I've just uh, raised everything to make uh, more space for what's about to happen. So you might be tempted to just use the 5% rule to, to multiply, to just uh, get rid of the x's on the denominator, but you can't do that. If you look at your KEQ, that is a pretty positive number. That's 750, um, or that's a number above one, and it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty um, high magnitude number. So that means you're gonna have quite a bit of dissociation happening. That means you can't just say that the x is gonna be negligible. Um, instead, you're just gonna have to do out the whole quadratic. So let's do out the math here. So if we multiply both sides by the denominator, x is gonna equal 750 times 10 to the negative three minus x times four times 10 to the negative two minus x. Let's take this step by step. So let's multiply these two things in parentheses together. So x is gonna equal 750 uh, times x squared uh, minus, let's do negative 10 to the negative three minus four times 10 to the negative two. That's gonna give, uh, give us our x value, so 0.041x, and then we're gonna have plus uh, four times 10 to the negative five um, as is. So let's make this all equal to zero. So let's uh, first multiply out the 750 and then subtract by x. So you're gonna have uh, 750x squared and then you're gonna have negative 0 uh, 0.041 times 750, and then you're gonna uh, subtract the x on both sides, so minus one. Your x value comes out to negative 31.75x, and then your constant is going to be four times 10 to the negative five times 750, which is 0 0.03, and that all equals to zero. From here, you're gonna to have to use the quadratic formula, which uh, if you remember from <laughs> algebra is negative b plus minus the square root of b squared minus four ac over two a. And so this is your a, this is your b, this is your c. So x is going to equal uh, negative, negative 31.75 plus minus 
negative thirty one point seventy five squared uh, minus four times a, which is seven fifty, uh, and then c is zero point zero three, and then all that over two a, so two times seven fifty. And so if you plug that into your calculator, which I've uh, done here, you get two values for x. So x can equal uh, 0.0414, or x can equal 9.67 times 10 to the negative 4. Now, which value do you use? Well, if you remember, your uh, concentration for I2 was going to be uh, 10 to the negative 3 minus x. And our first value here, that 0.0414, is actually greater than our uh, 10 to the negative 3 which means that if you plugged in x, you'd get a negative concentration for I2, which is impossible. Uh, therefore, you'd have to use this one. And so uh, our concentration of I2 is going to be 10 to the negative 3, 10 to the negative 3 minus that uh, 9.67 uh, to the negative 4. And so our equilibrium concentration is 3.3 times 10 to the negative 5 molar. And the answer choice closest to that is going to be answer choice B. Let's move on to question 35. Which changes will result in the number of moles of I2 present at equilibrium? One, increasing the temperature. For this, we have to go back to our top statement, which tells you that problems 34 and 35 are about the exothermic reaction. Now, since this is exothermic, then we can uh, add a sort of uh, heat to the product side. So let's rewrite the uh, equation here. So I2 uh, plus I minus is an equilibrium with I3 minus. And since this is exothermic, we can write heat on the product side. Now, if you increase the temperature, the system's going to be like, okay, how do I decrease the temperature? And you can decrease the temperature by getting rid of heat. And the way you use up heat is going to be the uh, reverse reaction. And the reverse reaction does increase the number of moles of I2. Therefore, one is correct. Two, replacing the uh, Ki with equal mass of NaI. NaI, sodium iodine, has a lower molar mass than Ki, so all you're doing is adding more I minus, which is not going to have much of an effect if you don't increase your I2, and if anything, that would just increase the, the number of moles of product that you have. Um, so two would not increase the moles of I2 present at equilibrium, Therefore, our answer is one only, or A. Finally, number 36, a 0.1 molar aqueous solution of H2SeO3 is titrated with one molar sodium hydroxide solution. At the point marked with a circle on the titration curve, which species comp uh, comprise at least 10% of the total selenium in solution. Now, this titration graph is characteristic of a polyprotic acid, which makes sense since we are titrating H2SeO3, and it has multiple hydrogen atoms. So let's figure out what's happening at these equivalence points. The equivalence points are these vertical jumps. Um, so you have two of them. And at your equivalence point, you're going to have one of your hydrogens being completely reacted. So at your first uh, uh, equivalence point, what you're going to have is that your H2SEO3 is going to be completely titrated. And then you're going to have HSEO3 uh, negative. Now, that's going to be at this titration curve. What about our second titration curve? Well, our second titration curve means that your HSEO3 is going to be completely titrated, and you're going to deprotonate that second hyd uh, hydrogen, and you're going to be left with uh, SEO3 2 minus. And so at that point, all you're going to have in terms of selenium is going to be this ion right here. Um, and the answer choice that best reflects that is going to be answer choice D, and that is your answer. All right, that was the equilibrium section of the 2023 USNCL local exam. I hope you're able to learn something. I hope this is helpful. Um, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you later. Peace.